and welcome to Get Rich Slow, the podcast that challenges a conventional get rich quick ideology by finding out what authentic success really means and how you can achieve it. I'm Hannah Martin, founder of Talented Ladies Club, and today I am joined by Susie Mark, the founder of Tropic Skincare, for an episode on business ethics. So hello, Susie. Hi, Hannah. Lovely to see you again. How are you? And you. Thank you so much for being to do this. Um, and I'm really excited to learn about how you have, I mean, sure that you've grown a business that's been financially successful, but is also ethical, um, in particular in an industry that's not renowned for ethics generally. Um, but first, I'd really love to know, so what does success mean for you? That's an interesting question, Hannah, and I think it is very personal to everybody. But I think success to me means being being surrounded by that I love spending time with every day, whether it's being my colleagues, um, my loved ones, you know, my friends, my family, it's been time with those that you love. And I'm very privileged in the sense that I do feel successful in that way, that you know, my work is surrounded by people that I love. And I have that work life balance where I get to also spend time with my friends and just always being surrounded by energy. That to me is true success. That sounds pretty good to me too. Um, so obviously you're the founder of Tropic Skincare and you have a very famous business partner. Um, mm -hmm. so when did you start Tropic and what was your vision for the business when you began it? So I first started Tropic when I was 15 years old. I was um, at school, I was doing my mock GCSEs and revising for those. And I kind of came up with the idea of setting up my own business simply to help my mum pay the bills. So my original vision was literally just to help my mum keep up with the monthly bills that we were unable to keep up with at the time and potentially grow it into something able to afford me a university degree um, in London and then enable me to get a better paid job in the future when I grew up. So the ambitions were at that time to me was huge, but looking back, probably fairly modest. Um, but yeah, but actually on the first day that I started selling my skincare products, my body scrub in the beginning, the only thing that I really wanted to do was to make 80 pounds so I could pay off the water bill that was really overdue. And you sold an issue on Mark, didn't you? And, and via friends, is that true? Exactly, that's exactly what I did. So I went to Greenwich Market, I had 50 body scrubs that I made in my mum's kitchen at home. Um, they were made using jam jars as the packaging and a body scrub recipe that my grandma gave to me um, when I was in India. And actually I used stuff on my print stick onto my jam jars that I printed um, at my school and then that's how I started and that's how I sold and over the next few years so I kind of sold body scrubs my tropic body scrubs um, throughout my education and over time I started to get my friends involved so I'd have my friends sell for me um, so I started Greenwich I had my ex-boyfriend at the time sell for me at Camden Market. I had a stall um, at Portobello Market and um, Spitalfields Market, so all across London. And then over the summer school holidays, sometimes there'll be various events going on. So there was something called Toast Festival. There was a Thames Festival in London. There was the Ideal Home Show. There was the Vitality Show. I'd get all of my friends together and we'd best stand and we'd sell all the products together. Um, and I'd pay everyone a 20% commission. So what made you decide to apply for The Apprentice? Uh, right. So my initial goal of starting off with Tropic was, actually, let me, let me take you back a step. So when I was 15, um, I remember going, so this is before I started my business, I remember going to my careers advisor at school and asking her what job do I need to do and what path do I need to take to get into a career that is going to get me the most amount of money fastest? And I, I asked this question because I didn't grow up with a lot of money and my parents always struggled with finances. And when my mother and I moved here to the UK, we really struggled thought that money was the answer to happiness. And so I did actually want to get rich quick, actually, Hannah. So the career 
the wealth you want to earn the most amount of money quickest at the youngest age the easiest thing to get well the best thing to get into is finance so you need to get a good maths and economics GCSE then do maths and economics for your A level, then get into one of the top universities in the UK, then go into one of the big investment banks, such as the ones in Canary Wharf, and do something that is fast, that is flow, so trading, um, and so trading FX. And so I did exactly that. I The money that I made through selling body scrubs over the weekends and through my friends, um, during my school years, I put into funding my university degree, I used philosophy and economics. I started an internship at Citigroup, trading FX, foreign exchange, exactly what the careers advisor said. But then I realized that I just didn't enjoy it, that I was doing purely for the money and not for the passion. When I was there at my desk, trading FX, and being this intern and this apparent dream job of mine, I was just so unhappy. Success meant to me. And I mentioned that it was being surrounded by people that I love, being able to spend time with people, any of that. I didn't really like the people that I was working with. I didn't like the environment I was in and I didn't have time to spend with my mum, with my friends, with the people that I really loved. And I didn't, even though it was very difficult to get the job that I had as a postgraduate, I just, I didn't feel successful. And that's when I decided that I wanted to go back to doing my business. And I knew that I had to get investment in order to start my business up again, because I actually closed that off after uh, my second year of uni. Um, and one of the opportunities that I applied for for investment was The Apprentice. Did that whole sugar changed the price of the a hundred thousand pound job to a quarter of a million pound investment into your business for 50 percent share and i just thought why not let's give it a go so that's why i applied to re reignite restart tropic and um and to do something other than banking <laughs> and it's definitely a gamble that's paid off for you isn't it yeah it has it has and for anyone who watched the apprentice i actually didn't win the apprentice I was in the final, but Lord Sugar pointed his finger at me and fired me in the end. <laughs> but he did. But he did invest after all anyway, because I think, you know, I I sent him um, a bunch of skincare products, which he did not yeah. use. And he gave it to his wife, Lady Anne, to use, and she loved them. And on the back of that, he just he just asked how much money I wanted for a fifty percent share of my business. And being, a, I kind of thought, well, maybe it's not worth. 250 in me I'll just ask for less than what everyone else has and I'll go for 200 and um and yeah and he said yes so that was back in 2011 when he first invested and do you know why because obviously there are a lot of skincare brands out there why did he choose to invest in you what was it about Tropic that he felt had the potential did I ask him this question and for Lord Sugar he doesn't invest in the business he invests in the person I think he saw a lot of synergies between um, him and, and myself and I, you know, Logic started his business on the back of a, on the back of a van selling TV aerials and he has hustled really hard, you know, he's come from very, very humble beginnings. He saw that same energy and drive from me. The fact that we both did not come from money. We both have that hunger and drive to, and that determination to, 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 finance our families and um and I think he saw that level of grit in me that he had and thought maybe I could make this business work with him because just because we we had a similar mindset uh, what's he like as a business partner what's he is is he hands-on he can be very hands-on so Lord Sugar is um he actually he's living in florida at the moment so the time difference is a little bit difficult but we will come we'll, we'll probably touch base at least once a week and we have a proper call about that every single month he deeply cares about tropic and the business and he's very very much invested in the business um more so now than the beginning because tropic has grown so much and it's such a big part of his portfolio of investments um but i like to think that he loves the business you know, we, 
we don't always agree on everything because we have such different um, experiences. I'm, he's 75, I'm 33, he's male, I'm female. He's always been into electronics and cars and football and into beauty products. But, you know, we do agree on a lot of things though. You know, we agree on the ethics of the business, the overall vision of the business, about the business, we always do agree on. And it's actually, I'm very grateful that he believed in me from the get to need to support me and the business. And so how come, so you, you have a, a network marketing model. Um, is that how you would describe it? Is that the, the, the right term? And so what, what made you adopt that? Because you didn't, yeah, so you didn't have that before The Apprentice, did you? So how, how, what, how did that happen? No. How did that evolve? Yeah, so um, great question. So interestingly, actually before The Apprentice, I mentioned that I had my friends selling for me at commission, um, and I built quite a large team of people direct to me. Everyone was just on 20% commission and they would be selling at various events and markets. And even my friend's parents would get involved and in selling um, our skincare products. So I was used to the notion of selling by commission um, with no kind of like basic guaranteed income. And, I, and it worked really well with a lot of actors and actresses, part-time people who just wanted a side gig. And Basically, what happened was after Lord Jagram invested, I used his money to move out of my mom's kitchen, get my own premises, start manufacturing on a larger scale, and employ some members of staff to help me with customer service and um, dispatch and packing parcels. But then I kind of didn't really know where to go further from there. The only thing I was used to was doing events and exhibitions. And I said to Lord Sugar, you know, we could continue doing events and exhibitions. And he said, oh, maybe we could start looking at wholesaling to department stores like John Lewis and he started putting in contact with people but then it just like with me for us to manufacture a huge load of products um where we'd have to give them the products first and then the monitor, not very good for cash flow but also not good for the for the products and it lost out that's all touch that I'd always selling the products directly through myself at market stores or through my friends. And that was when I, I had a phone call from one lady in particular, her name was Jill, and she worked with a company called Virgin V. So Virgin V, I think they ran for 18 years, but skincare it was a direct selling skincare company of Richard Branson. They had huge Virgin V stores across the country. And I think about, I don't know how many, I want a thousand consultants at their prime. They did really, really well. And they were massive. And um, they had a huge portfolio of products from makeup to skincare to body care. But the problem with Virgin V was it just never run very well. I think it was perceived as a good brand and good sales and the consultants were very happy, but behind the scenes from a management perspective, it wasn't managed very well. Like their P&L, their expenditure was just always more than what they made. And so in the end, the company actually folded. And when the company folded, there obviously was a huge amount of consultants that were left. You know, they had their businesses that they spent, for some of them, up to 18 years growing. All of a sudden, the rug pulled out from under their feet. You know, the, the customer base that they, they, they had grown, um, the teams that they had grown, all of a sudden, they were earning nothing because that company had folded. And so I had a phone call from somebody, um, Jill, as I mentioned, who was a part of that company. And she just, she saw the synergies, I think, between Richard Branson and Lord Sugar and just said, I think you should start off in direct selling. You know, we did a huge, well, I have a, a wonderful team. Um, I've got ambassadors who could join you, who could start selling your skincare products in the same way that we did Virgin V. Um, but we just have a different brand. And hopefully this time we run better in the sense that you guys will be profitable so that we have longevity in this business. And to be completely honest with you, when she first got in contact, I didn't really know what direct selling or social selling was. I had heard of a, and what I thought of when I 
when someone talks about Avon, which maybe a lot of us think about, are kind of like little old ladies knocking on people's doors with a catalog and, and selling products that way. I hadn't considered a more modern approach using software and social media and all the other new ways of selling nowadays. That's just the kind of the stereotypical vision I had of what Avon was when I asked her to liken Virgin V to another brand. Avon was the only one that I had heard of. Anyway, after a few conversations with her and a few other expert and B consultants and Lord Sugar, it just felt like, uh, you know, they talked about giving women the opportunity to make their own income, to build their own teams, to sell products when it's flexible and, and, and suitable for them, that enables them to build a business that is shaped around their family. And it just made sense. It meant that we could continue to make the products fresh. It continued to be sold via demonstration. The ambassadors were continuing to be paid on commission in the same way that my, um, that my friends were. And we thought, let's give it a go, why not? One thing that Lord Sugar and I did do some research on was we did learn more about the industry. And we did notice that there were some um, businesses some MLMs that were not ethical, that did not trade in the right way, that had lots of terms in place that always call a consultant out, that tried and put them in a cycle of debt. We knew about all of this once we started doing the research and we wanted to ensure that whatever we created quickly was done in a way that really gave women an opportunity to earn a genuine business model. And you know, for Lord Sugar, He's, he's a billionaire, you know, he doesn't, he's 75 years old. He was 65 back then. He didn't really, he has more money than he needs to last him, uh, him and, his, and his whole family. The reason why he does the, why he invested in traffic in me is because he wants to encourage more entrepreneurs within the industry. He wants to encourage more people to stand on their own two feet, to, um, to you know, corporate lab, all the all the rubbish that comes with office politics to just stand on your own two feet and build your own business so he really it was really important to him and myself that we had a genuine amazing business model that was ethical that offered people a real opportunity so we worked with some industry consultants um really well-known ethical ones to help us build a business model that was going to give us just that so minimal depth um, at the moment, we pay up to three levels. Lots of other multi-level companies pay up to like 20, some are binary, you know, infinite levels. We wanted to make sure that there was no minimal targets. So you don't like do an X amount of sales every month in order to be able to be an ambassador. Um, we also put in other caveats, like you can't hold stock, um, which makes sense anyway, because our products are made fresh. They have a relatively short expiry date relative to other skincare brands. And so we spent about a year putting together this business model. We kind of shared it with our initial ambassadors, of which there were 400. And we officially launched, so Lord Sugar invested at the end of 2011. And we officially launched our social selling model um, on May the 4th, 2013. So we're just about to celebrate our anniversary. So it took us some time to get it right. And we launched it at Hertford University with 400 customers who became our founding ambassadors. And we launched with just seven products, actually, because that's all I had back then. <laughs> you launched five days after TLC did. So we, we put our birthdays very, very close. Oh, amazing. Yes. amazing. Um, so, Gilles, so obviously, I know that you, so you, you and Lord Sugar wanted to create an ethical business within this model. And I, I know this industry, um, I've done a lot of investigation on it. And it's not a it generally it's not an ethical industry. And I think the the average um, 99.6 percent of um, people who own an MLM on average will lose money once business expenses are taken into account. Um, and I know that you have put things in place within Tropic, and I know you know much more. You just mentioned that some of the things that you do. Um, have you ever you know building a business in that industry? Have you ever come across a time when you've had to make decisions in the moment whereby? There's, you know, this is how normally MLMs work and that's where they make money. And you've had to take quite a gamble on the other way, like to stand by your ethics. Have you had to make decisions that would maybe have lost you money where it would be yeah. easier to perform for the quicker win financially? Absolutely. 
so so many examples have just come into my mind i mean i remember i mean we are a very predominantly female industry um but lots of men join the mlm businesses as well and i remember there was this i mean let me give you a few examples hannah i remember a few years ago there was um a guy that joined our business and he was doing ridiculous sales or sales and we couldn't understand how he was like a you know a suited and booted kind of straight guy that came in just didn't look like the skincare type mm. and and when i looked at the figures and looked at him and thought how are you making so much money how are you selling so much anyway upon further digging what i realized was that he was buying loads of stock and he was going out and he was doing big exhibitions where he was paying like so much money to have a stand at big exhibitions across the country. I'm taking you like six, seven years back now. And he was shifting a lot of stock, but he was also spending a lot of money on the stand or dressing the stand. Now I've done exhibitions. I know how much they cost. And I also know that with the commission that you get with those margins that you would never make profit. And he wasn't making profit in, and you know, I think for a lot of other MLM companies, they would look at those figures and think, but he's making us loads of money, so carry on. Um, but what we did very quickly was that we took him off the system. We bought back all the stock that he bought. We asked him to cancel, and actually we contacted the exhibitions that he was booked in with and told them to not allow him to trade. And we put a rule in place where no ambassador of ours can sign up to any large scale events of, I can't remember the exact number, but over a certain number, you can't attend them. Because we don't want you to be paying for loads and like for huge spaces that is going to cost loads of money. We also don't want you to be buying loads of stock so that you can sell at these exhibitions. Our business model is designed for one-to-one -one skincare consultations, for women to do pampers at each other's homes and do it in a way where you don't have to pay to be at a particular venue. Mm. And if you do want to do anything, any exhibition that is within our parameters, you still have to contact us and tell us you're doing it. So we make sure that, that if you're going to do it, we check in the cost, we make sure it's not going to be too expensive for you. And we also make sure that there's not going to be other ambassadors in that same exhibition hall or that same market or fair, so that it's not going to be too competitive. Can I ask then, so obviously Tropic has been very financially successful. Yeah. But you've done that by not pursuing, you know, making decisions like that where you could have made more money by having him do that and encouraging others to do that and using him as a case study, getting him on stage, kind of fating him as, yeah. you know, the, a brilliant leader. So how are you, why are you able to be financially successful by, I think I said, why aren't other MLMs doing this? Why are they not following your example? Because if you can, if you can make money while operating as ethical a business model as you can in that sector, why aren't they doing it? Can they not do that too? Absolutely, they can. But I think it's very easy to be seduced by the initial sales. And I think, you know, a lot of, you know, we are a business that is privately owned. And for me, this business is my life. I am the face of this brand. I started this brand when I was 15 years old. I live and breathe Tropic. Everyone who is around me my team at HQ, they mean the world to me. The ambassadors that I have in my business, they're like family to me. You know, they're like my sisters. And all I want is for them to be truly happy and successful. And if, and if they are not making money, and if they are not, not spending their money wisely, and at the end of the day, then I don't, I don't have a business. Like, that's not good for me. I think with a lot of other MLM companies, it's not one person, it's owned by a board. They might be a public company that their decisions are driven by stakeholders and bottom line profit and not actual vision of what's good for the people in the business. Like I'll, I'll give you a really, um, another example, Hannah, and this is a more recent example. So um, in the beginning of the lockdown, um, two years ago, like the whole time, right? All of a sudden we, we suddenly flux of, and we, and we didn't put a rule on this before, but we had influencers who came into the business who were recruited by our ambassadors who started promoting Tropic on their social media platforms. 
And I'm not talking like crazy big influencers with millions of followers. I'm talking about influencers with a few tens of thousands of followers, still significant. And I would still call them influencers. And every, um, every few months we'll do like a, like a leaderboard or like an incentive to be like, here are the top salespeople. And normally the top salespeople will do like four, four, four five thousand pounds a month worth of sales, which is phenomenal by the way. Like that's insane for someone to be doing pumpers and selling that much in a month. And, and we always celebrate these people. These influencers come along and all of a sudden we're looking at the leaderboard and I'm like, oh my God, they're doing like 30,000 pounds a month. How am I going to celebrate the 5,000 pound people? So I'm looking at 30,000 pounds a month, which is phenomenal. They're doing it in an ethical way. They're selling to their platform, they're, they're following and they're giving good customer advice. You know, they're giving good like skincare advice and they're giving good customer service. So there's nothing technically wrong there. But what then happened was the ambassadors started thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm rubbish. I thought 5,000 pounds was really good or I'm only doing 200 pounds. I'm, I'm only doing 50 pounds worth of sales. There's someone doing 30 grand. I'm totally rubbish. I cannot be doing normal pampering. I need to be going online and becoming an Instagram influencer. So I suddenly have, have all these ambassadors who thought that the, the only way to be lucrative was to become an influencer. They poured hours and hours and hours of their time. They paid for courses on how to be a social media influencer. They started doing selfies and recording what they were eating every day, trying to be this influencer overnight. They were losing sleep over it. They were spending way hours and they weren't free, but they weren't making any more money because I'm an influencer overnight. You can't just, it's not easy to make money online. And then at the same time, we had, Ambassadors, we had team leaders who were thinking, gosh, I'm, I'm missing a trick here. I need to be recruiting influencers. And they were starting to message influencers and being like, you should join my team. And they started to fight over people online. And it just became this horrible, everyone's like desperate to be more successful in the wrong way. And it just, if you look at any other multi-level marketing company, they have who can join a business. It's like, it's a free for all. Anyone can join a business. The more inf the more followers you have on Instagram, the better, because the more money you can make us. But for me, it just completely changed the dynamics of the business. For me, Tropic was supposed to be a platform for your everyday woman to make money, to make income, depending on what she wants to put in. And all of a sudden, when you have these influencers that have this huge wide reach, you change the ball game. And sometimes these influencers were taking sales from our existing ambassadors because maybe one of our ambassadors customers follow those influencers and buy from them instead. So what we then did was we took those influencers out of the business. They were not allowed to be ambassadors anymore. They were not allowed to publicly promote the Tropic products on their pages. They had to create a private page that their customers would be invited to. Those influencers were then not allowed to build teams. They were not allowed to be part of our leaderboard skew the data and make our everyday ambassadors feel bad and then anyone who has over 5,000 followers um, on their Instagram or Facebook page they won't be able to join the business they have to contact us and we have to talk to them and there might be a different way around it but we only want people to join the business if they do it in a way that is on par you know our business is built for the everyday woman it works for the influencer model and do you think that so thinking about what so what makes topic different to another M an MLM another MLM so first of all you obviously you genuinely have a, a, a product that is um you invest in I know you invest in your products and you innovate so you do have a genuine product people want and, and need and has value but do you think the key thing is um rather than um what often happens in MLM and, and I know I've seen a, a document and one very well-known MLM that they churn 99 percent in a year of their bottom level of people. So the entry level distributors, 99% of those will leave within a year. Do you think the secret of the Tropic success is rather than ignore these people who actually may only make a heart 200 pounds a month or, or, or retail 200 pounds a month, is actually celebrating these people and making sure they're looked after and retaining these people. Do you think that maybe is a secret to assess why you've achieved success in an ethical way in an industry that, that 
the, the, the general perception is the only way to make money in MLM is not to have ethics. That's certainly how I perceive it. Yeah. And, you know, Hannah, I, I actually don't think it's a secret. I think it's something that I am trying to shout from the rooftops um, with our infinite purpose and everything that we do. You know, in terms of the MLM, social selling, direct selling space, whatever you want to call it, I know that Tropic is one of the fastest growers um, within this industry. Why? I genuinely believe it's because of our ethics. By ethics. And you prioritize the people in your business, be it the people in your, or the people in the field, our ambassadors. Those, we have incredibly loyal ambassadors that have been with us. I've not seen our ambassadors for more than two years now, but I've just come back seeing just over 350 ambassadors where we spent a week together abroad. And some of those ambassadors have been with us literally from day dot. They were part of the 400 original ambassadors that joined um, nine years ago. And when you build that trust and loyalty and when people feel that you genuinely have their interests at heart, not only does that make you feel better as a business owner, you sleep better at night knowing that you're doing the right thing, it also drives that loyalty. And that person will bring in genuine passion and bring in more business for you. So not only does it make sense from an ethical point of view, it also makes sense from a business perspective. You know, I, I, there's, a, there's a phrase from um, the guy who founded McDonald's, like his name escapes me now, but he said, look after your customers and the business will look after itself. And I believe that. But I also believe beyond your customers, look after all the people in your business, not just your customers, but your ambassadors, your HQ staff. Make sure they know that you deeply care about them, that you put their interests and the people will work hard for you and people will do what needs to be done if they feel like they're a part of an engine that is a force for good, that is looking out for them. And I think that's what a lot of the other MLM companies are missing. They don't have that loyalty. And how do you, I mean, you've mentioned a few examples of how you've dealt in situations whereby you maybe needed to step in and, and look at what's happening on the ground in your business. Um, Another kind of often criticism that's I think well founded in MLMs is that rather than a, you having a company and having employees who are paid and have legal rights, but also therefore have, represent the company and have, you know, that you have direct influence and control over them, often MLM reps they are seen as sort of lone wolves out, out there. You know, they 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 are not employees; they are um, independent consultants and. Mm -hmm. When I know that when I have dealt with organizations and companies and I've brought up issues that I've seen things that their reps are making income claims and health claims that are, are contra to, to what the rules are. And these companies, the response is always, well, we can't, you know, how can we help that? Because they're, they're not employees. So how do you deal with that topic? You know, with a workforce of consultants who may not always behave in a way that reflects your ethics. How do you make sure, first of all, how do you make sure that they are as well-trained as possible? And then how do you, what do you do if you hear about, if someone comes to you and says, look, I've seen this post by one of your, your ambassadors and, it, and yeah. it's not ethical. How do you, how do you deal with that? I think, I think the, the argument that they're not employees, so we can do nothing about it is a bit, um, at the end of the day, you know, our ambassadors are representing our brand um, what they do in their personal lives, you know, whatever they believe in in terms of their religion, their political, you know, whatever side, you know, on that front is up to them. But if they represent our brand in a way that is not ethical, then absolutely as a brand, as a brand, we can step in and say, you're not allowed to do this. And if you continue doing this, you, you will cease to be an ambassador. And, and we have done this on numerous occasions. We have very, very clear cut rules. So when the ambassador joins, they have, we have something called the lounge, you do your training. We have a quiz to make sure that you have ticked off all the boxes to maintain that you have fully understood. You also do more training with yeah, who brought you into the business. And then after you've done all your training, if you breach the rules, we have, we have like the, I don't like to call it the Tropic Police, but we have 30 ambassador support girls who are, literally on social media all the time, checking to see what people are posting. So we have had issues in the past, of course, from ambassadors who have posted the earnings online, who have made making money with Tropic 
seemingly easy that anyone can do it when we know that's not the case and ambassadors who have said things like join me or even find out about the opportunity about joining the business our ambassadors are not allowed to do any of that publicly so you will not see a tropic ambassador saying anything to the like of find out about joining as an ambassador through me or i love making so much money as an ambassador if you want to make the money of your dreams or if you want to earn as much as me or if you want to go on a free holiday and have a flexible lifestyle like me find out more about joining as an ambassador contact me here or leave a, leave a heart in the comments or anything like that you would not see that with our tropic ambassadors if you do let us know because we'll get in contact with them <laughs> but our ambassadors cannot do that unless it's on their private pages and in private conversations because we want to make sure that anyone who is who our ambassadors talk to who want to join the business are already products first at the end of the day we sell products and we don't sell opportunities it's always product first unless you have a passion for the products you will not have a passion for the business and that's the whole concept between like quality and quantity we want quality ambassadors and that's why when they join we invest in their education we invest in their language that they can use we have um like a social media library we call it tropic social that they can go in and pick ready-made squares of what you can say that they can then post on their social medias and they can schedule the posts. We have um, customer service apps that our ambassadors can use for free and download and connect with their customers because that's the relationship we want to nurture first and foremost. And then we have 30 amazing women at HQ who are constantly policing and making sure that everyone is, is saying the right things and seeing off the same hint. On top of that, we connect with the leaders, of which there are just over the business um, every single month. We do a live with them every month. I'm constantly meeting up with everyday ambassadors. We're just about to start HQ events again. Um, so every year we have HQ visits where our ambassadors get to come to HQ and see how our products are made, visit our lab, make some products with us. And it's those connect driving that ethical value in the business and how we speak and how we don't speak and continuously driving that maintains that that law that ethical feel within tropic and it's not difficult to implement if you really wanted to oh so what for you has been the hardest part of growing a company like tropic from just you and selling at your friends to something the size of you have now what have you found most difficult about growing and running tropic Oh, most difficult, Hannah. I mean, you'll know from running a business that there are so many difficult challenges that you face um, in all the different areas. But I would say, I would say it is the education and the connection part. You know, we have just over 20,000 active ambassadors who are selling at Tropic, and they come from all corners of the country. And they are all different ages. They have all different backgrounds. It's trying to find a way to communicate with all of them in a way that each of them understand and appreciate and have time to listen to or to watch and absorb the, the same information in the same way and deliver the same service to their customers and talk about the brand in the same way. That has been a challenge. And then you know, there's been a big learning curve. There are some, even, even some bits of terminology that we've used where we've said things like um, our products are made in... Britain, very proud to be British and things like that. And we realize, oh, actually Northern Ireland isn't a part of Britain. So making sure that our language is, is good for everyone and that we're fully inclusive and also making sure that our educational pieces are short and succinct enough that people will want to watch and listen to. Because I've done educational pieces where it's gone on for a long time. <laughs> but, the, but you can see like on jump off and you see people's engagement for the first five minutes are really high and then they start to log off their brain switches off so it's figuring out how to speak to people and, and kind of communicate that language and the brand ethics in a way that everyone understands and everyone appreciates and what are you most proud of of, of your achievements with tropic um again so many things Do you know i feel very privileged that we we have an infinite purpose at Tropic, and that's to help create a healthier, greener, and more empowered world. And I believe that as a business, as any business, you've got to ask yourself the question, are you adding 
to the problems, and there are so many problems with the world, or are you helping to solve the problems? And I'm talking problems from everything from, you know, the issues with MLM and women being exploited, all the way through to environmental issues. And I just want to make sure that as a business, we are always helping to solve the problem. Everything that we do from um, being carbon negative, helping to create a greener world, all the way through to um, helping our ambassadors earn a better income. But I suppose the, bet, the most impactful thing that we're doing, that we've been doing for the last few years, is what we're doing with education across the world. Um, we partnered with an amazing charity called United Roll Schools about four years ago. And we helped to fund days of education for children living in some of the most remote, underprivileged places around the world. And last year, we funded education uh, for a whole year for 12,000 children across the world. And next week, actually not even next week, literally on Monday, I'll be, actually no, sorry, not next Monday, the following Monday, um, I'm actually going to be going to Nepal to open up our second school um, in a really remote region in uh, northeast of Nepal, which is really exciting. So I think that's the proudest thing that I've ever done, helping to fund education and to drive positive change for that future generation who otherwise would not have had any other opportunity because they're stuck in that poverty. That's an amazing legacy, isn't it? It, it, yeah. it affects not just you and not just those children, but then what they go on to be and what they go on to contribute to the world and achieve in their own lives. Exactly. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that we try to teach our ambassadors. You know, with a lot of times in the MLM world, you'll see people talking about sales and I've made this much money and that much money. Well, every 50 pounds spent on Tropic is one day of education. So we've tried to change the narrative with our ambassadors to say, you know, rather than saying I've done, I've done five thousand pounds worth of sales this month. Say that you've done that you've just helped to fund fifty days of education or five hundred days of education. That sounds so much more impressive because it's it's no one cares about money. You know, it's, it's when someone when you see a post and someone say I've done five thousand pounds or twenty thousand pounds or whatever, it kind of washes over you. Which mm. free it's not attached to a value. Say, I've helped to put, you know, education for a child for a whole month. That is something tangible that you can put value on. Mm. And that's what's meaningful. And it's changed that narrative. And I'm proud that, you know, when I see posts from ambassadors now, they're saying things like, yeah, I helped to send this many kids to school last year with my team or we've done this. And they're thinking bigger than just their own paycheck and what they And I'm really proud of that. So. Shit. And that's the whole thing. What one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is that you know we live in a world that's very materialistic and consumer based, and you know it's what you can buy. And you know for me, money is a is a way to freedom, and it buys you a freedom in that the things you can do in the way you make the world a better place for you, your family, people beyond that. Money in and of itself, and literally the material things you can purchase are a very short term shallow um sort of achievement really doesn't really satisfy you other than yeah. you know what what is earning what is earning lots of money really going to bring to your life you know the money yeah. itself isn't really better but what it is that you can do um so what drives you then so you know obviously i mean you've been phenomenally successful and you're clearly a very driven person you were from a very young age um you know, obviously, initially you were driven by the idea, which I think a lot of teenagers are. It's like, how can I earn money? What's going to make me money? Yeah. Um, and and now I can see, you know, your purpose has shifted the topic. But what what drives you to be so successful? And when do you stop? Like, do you have an end point in mind? Yeah. So you know, when I first started Tropic, what drove me was my mum to help to help us be financially stable and for us not to worry about money because money is important for sure. What drives me now to be on the people side, what drives me now is our ambassadors. And what drives me now is our, is the children that we educate. You know, I could, if I wanted to right now, sell Tropic and my life and live on a tropical island. But I know that that wouldn't, that would not give me satisfaction. I think that I would be bored out of my mind. And I think that I wouldn't view that as success because as I mentioned, success is being surrounded by people whom you love spending time with all the time. Um, 
And to add to that, success has also been able to help those that you love, that you care about. Like having the ability, actually, yeah, that's, that's probably a better definition of success. Success to me is being able to have the time to spend with the people that you love and have the resources to help the people that you love to make a positive impact in their lives. And I know that if I were to just sell everything now and sit on a beach somewhere, have that. I wouldn't have the connection with the ambassadors that I do today. I wouldn't have that connection with my team who I love. And I wouldn't be able to go across the world and, and spend time with these children um, that I'll be doing next week. So what drives me now is continuing to make sure that my ambassadors are thriving, that they are getting what they need out of the business, which isn't always money. A lot of them um, barely do any sales. They barely do any, you know, they don't really get involved in selling or it's not what drives them. But for a lot of them, it's just being a part of that community. They come along to our ambassadors events. Um, they tune in to some of my not to use skincare products. Um, it's also making sure that, you know, last year, as I mentioned, we educated 12,000 children. And like, if, if Tropic doesn't keep on going as it is now, I think about those kids and I'm like, where are they, how are they going to be learning? If I'm not funding the same 12,000 children this year as I did last year, how are they going to be educated? What's going to happen to them? So I have a commitment to them. We open up our boat yeah. a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic. I Those kids drive me when I met them and I hug them and I promised them. I had a translation. I was like, I promise like you'll have a different and you'll be that teacher if you want to like they motivate me now and I love it I love having a purpose and having that drive that gives me focus on why we do this business short-term profits is about long-term stability every decision is ensuring that the business is stable for as long as possible and um, kind of running it at the helm, like that will always be my focus to ensure that stability to keep it. And that's quite a, it's quite a heavy burden to carry, is it? Because so it's not just about you anymore and, and what you want to achieve for you and then your your mum and your family. Suddenly you've now you've got your employees, you've got the community of ambassadors, and now you've got these children all over the world. So there's a lot of kind of responsibility, isn't there, to maintain that for all those people. You can't drop the ball. Because if you do, then then there's people you let down. Yeah, and it is a lot of responsibility, but I think as long as you surround yourself with people who have the same passion, the same vision, and are very privileged that I do at HQ, it is that shared responsibility coming on our shoulders at HQ. And as long as we continue being driven by the right purpose, and that we are running the business ethically and sometimes it is compromising on short-term sales you know we we don't have recruited loads of incredible influences that will generate tens of thousands of pounds for tropic you know or people who are going to big scale events and and selling loads but if those don't align with our ethics then we don't do them or we maintain long term and we make sure that everything we do is for the longevity of the business and everyone everyone's passions and everyone's vision is aligned to that then, you know, I don't, I don't, I feel very relaxed about the future, actually. I feel like my vision is very clear. I feel it's very easy being guided by something so black and white. And with everybody at HQ also driven by the same thing, I know that all decisions will be made for the right reasons. And so although it is a big responsibility, it's a shared one. And I don't feel, I, don't, I probably don't feel as much pressure as I enjoy for me. I, can, I love what I do. And that's what I was going to say. It's really clear, like I spoke with you a few times, how much fun you have and how it almost feels like with you. And I know this is my business. It kind of feels like a hobby that I'm privileged enough to earn money from. Yeah, yeah. I would yeah. do this free because I love it. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really, for me, a really good place to be on in business because, you you know, you you never get tired because you're always interested in it. Exactly. But can I ask you, yeah. 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 I was like, can I ask you one last question? Um, so what advice do you have? Because there may be people out there who are pursuing success and who may be finding it elusive right now. Um, what advice do you have for those people? That's quite a big question. But... Let me give a few pieces of advice. Um, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs who are starting out, who 
don't really know what the next steps are. And they ask me, you know, how, sometimes they just ask me, how do you be successful? <laughs> um, you know, really broad questions. And I think first and foremost, ask yourself, what are you pursuing? Like, what are you really pursuing? Identify what success looks like to you. Um, identify the feeling that you want when you're successful. Because for a lot of people, when I've asked, what does success look like to you? Like, what, what do you want? They'll say things to me like, I want to make a million pounds a year. Or I want to, I want to have a, I want to be on a hundred million. But I want to, I want my business to be worth a hundred million in 10 years time. But that means nothing when you don't put a value to it. A lot of people don't even know what hundred million would buy them. Maybe, maybe all they really want is to live in a lovely three bedroom apartment by the Thames. And that's going to cost them 5 million and not a hundred million, sorry, a uh, uh, 100 million in the future so figure out what it is that you really tangibly want out of your business out of your life figure out what success is for me success isn't to do with like physical things I don't I'm, like, nice things but I don't I don't I don't have any designer clothes or anything like that like I said what gives me success and what drives me is the people and the connections and being able to have time with my family um, you know, quadruple my salary and I don't have time with my family, that's not success to me. So figure out what really success is to you and then work backwards on what you need to do to get there. Because it could be that it's ultimately not money. It could be that you want to make money so you can spend more time with your family, which you could do now. So you may only need to do a little bit more in your business. So write that down first. Um, you can really visualize what it is that you want success means to you. And then Whatever product or service you have, and I think people don't do this enough, do before you launch it, before you mass produce, do market research and ask as many people as possible, speak to your target audience and just cut every I and cross every T, ask the annoying questions, get your prototypes into the hands of as many people as possible. Because I've had situations where in the past we've launched products where I've skipped a few steps and they've launched and they've not been immediately excellent from day dot because I've suddenly realized problems or customers have fed back to me and I've had to pull, pull the product and redo it. And I've learned the hard way that unless you are one confident in your product, that you know that people will love it, it will not be successful. And so really make sure your product or service is brilliant. And it's specifically done for that person. And then the, sorry, for your target market. And then the final thing is just to make sure that you keep an eye on your bottom line. Be mm -hmm. scrappy, always. And even as a business, you know, we're, we're much bigger, obviously, than when I first started out. But I'm just as scrappy as I was when I first started out. I try to be really resourceful. Whenever we ask for a quotation, we ask for at least five quotes and compare them. We don't just pay for things. We negotiate at every opportunity. Don't ever lose that barter and that hustle. If someone quotes you something, see if you can get a better deal. See if you can um, get a faster service. Challenge people so that you save on every element of your business because ultimately your business means nothing if you're not making profit. People always talk about turnover and how much money they're making. You know, if we go back and I know that Richard won't mind me saying this because you know, I do know him well. Um, they turn over so much money, but that was all in vain because they were never in profit. And look what happened. You know, they lost out on thousands of ambassadors. They called them consultants back then. And they, you know, a lot of their lives were ruined because of that. And it was such a shame that such a big business meant nothing ultimately because they weren't making money. So those are the three things. Focus on your focus on what success really means to you write it down figure it out and work backwards to figure out what you need to do the second thing is to do your market research to make sure that your product or service is the best it possibly can be before you launch it and the final thing is just to focus on the bottom line be scrappy and always make sure that you're making profit even from day one Perfect. And I cannot, that third thing in particular, I cannot echo enough and I have a spreadsheet open on my laptop that's pinned and every day Every sale that comes in, I put it in there. I know exactly how much money I've made and it automatically counts um, my, it, it calculates my profit, my turnover. And so I know always every day how much my money is making and, and not enough people do that. And I think it's really important. If you don't know your numbers, you, you could be earning two pounds an hour in your business, but you don't know unless you do your numbers. So exactly. it's brilliant. Anyway.
Thank you so much, Susie, for your time and sharing your story. Thank you. And thank you for questions as well. I hope this has been helpful in some respects. But yeah, it's always such a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. And you too.